Hey Amen. Good morning. It's like to welcome out to the Potter's house, man, on this Sunday morning. Uh, so glad to be the house of God, amen, today. We're going to worship God together this morning. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Let's clap our hands. Let's lift our voices in this place, amen. As we worship God together, let's see this song from the top. As it comes, another Lord draws thee. As the coming of a Lord draws near, get ready to meet the King. He's coming in the clouds of heaven, He's coming back again. With a shout He will be saved, in power and glory. As the coming of a Lord draws near, get ready to meet the King. Saints will shout Amen as they meet Him in the air. And the saints will shout Amen. Jesus Christ is coming back again. One more time from the top. As the coming of the Lord draws near, get ready to meet the King. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. He's coming back again. He will descend in power and glory As the coming of the Lord draws near Get ready to meet the King And the saints will shout Amen As they meet Him in the air And the saints will shout Amen Jesus Christ is coming back again One more time and the saints and the saints will shout Amen As they meet Him in the air And the saints will shout Amen Jesus Christ is coming back again Yes, Jesus Christ And Jesus Christ is coming back again Oh yes, let's continue to worship His name as we sing it out from the top, Amen Yes, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Oh, yes, to sing up from its song. We worship God together in this place. Amen. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know. The way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward Little by little we're taking ground Every prayer a powerful weapon Strongholds come tumbling down and down and down We want to see Jesus lifted high Better than flies across this land That all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven to see Jesus lifted high, better that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step, we move. Little by little we're taking down Every prayer a powerful weapon Strongholds come tumbling down and down and down You see it from the top We want to see Jesus lifted high Better that flies across this land That all men might see the truth and know He's the way to heaven Oh yes We want to see Jesus lifted high Banner that flies across this land That all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven We want to see, we want to see, we want to see We want to see Jesus lifted high We want to see, we want to see
want to see, want to see Jesus lifted I Step by step we're moving forward, little by little we're taking ground. Every prayer a powerful weapon, strongholds come tumbling down and down and down. Oh yes, I'm a wonderful presence of God, amen, this morning. Let's continue to worship His name, amen. Let's lift our hands in this place, amen, lift our voices. Oh yes, in total surrender. Yes, amen, God is worthy to be praised, amen. We're going to seek His face this morning, lifting our voices in this place. And as the deep panted for the water so so long it to thee You alone of my heart Desire and I long to worship thee One more time, as the deer As the deer panted for the water So my soul Sing this song from its top, amen. What a beautiful name it is. Yes, you were the word at the beginning. As we lift our hands, let's worship God together in this place, amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God. Your love 
love was greater one could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a wonderful name it is nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh yes, yeah, death could not, and death could not hold you. The veil torn before you, silence the boast of sin and pain. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. This morning, I believe in God to help us, amen, with a couple of needs. Let's pray first and foremost, amen, for all of our uh, leaders in our country. I believe God to help, amen, our uh, prime minister, our premier. I believe God to help their lives, amen, uh, to give them guidance and direction. We cannot forget about all of our first responders as they continue to help on the front lines as well as all of our health care workers. Let's pray for these, amen, this morning. Let's also pray for all of our leadership churches, amen, uh, as well as there in Gallup, amen, Prescott, Arizona as well, Pastor uh, Greg and Lisa Mitchell. They have the conference that is starting next week on a Monday, and they'll be uh, welcoming delegates from all over the world in the states there in Prescott. So I want you to pray for them. God's hand to be upon their lives as they continue to launch out churches and push our, uh, our fellowship forward. Uh, Pastor Aragon and his wife Sandra, amen, back in Chinle. He was administering in Texas all last week for a, for a uh, revival. So we're going to pray that God's hand be upon their lives. Uh, without them, amen, this would not be possible. Let's pray for our Mother Church, as well as all of our friends here in Canada. You can see represented there on your screen, amen. Leaders of our uh, neck of the woods here, uh, Dave and Sherry Marks there in Chilliwack, and of course all the other churches you see there in BC, Edmonton, Ontario, and of course uh, Saskatchewan as well. I believe God for their lives. Also want you to pray uh, for all of our sister churches as well. Uh, these are churches out of Chinle, just like you and I in this place. Believe God for their lives in these various places, having God to help them, amen. Uh, so church, let's call upon God for all these things. 
Let's also continue to believe God for our lives. Amen. Various needs we have within our church as well. Pray for all of our converts as well, the men working up north, that God would be upon their lives and just help them uh, today, as well as our service today. We're going to believe that God has a special message for us to encourage us, amen, within our fasting. Uh, so this morning, church, let's lift up all these things. But if you're in this place, uh, you're with us, amen, you have a special need in your life this morning, go and make that known by an uplifted hand in this place, amen. You have a personal need in your life, amen. God sees and knows exactly what we need even before we ever ask, amen. Amen. So this church, let's call upon God together. Let's lift our voices, believing God to help us. Amen. This morning, church, let's pray. Uh, God, we come before you this day. God, we thank you and praise you and glorify you. God, for all that you've done and all that you are this day, we exalt you and glorify and worship your tremendous and mighty name, God. We plead your blood over this service, God, asking that your will would be done, that it would be accomplished. God, stir our hearts, Lord. God, impact us this day. Father, we pray, Father, God, for a special outpouring of your spirit upon our lives. God, to give us strength, to give us guidance and give us direction, oh God. We seek you this day, Lord God, that you would help, God, each and every one of us in this place. God, our personal needs. God, every single unsaved loved one, God, that you would move within their hearts, God, impact them this day. We pray, Lord God, that you would continue to help our fellowship, Lord God, and our brethren churches, Lord God, that you would be with them in their services today. God, even as you are with us, God, we seek you, God, for a fresh outpouring of your Spirit upon our lives this day, God, to do more than we could ever ask or speak, Father God. Go above and beyond our expectations and our ability, Lord God, help us. God, this day as we continue to seek your will, we thank you, God, we praise you, and Lord, you for all that you've done and everything we know look forward that you're going to do in our lives again in Jesus precious mighty name we pray and all God's people said amen and then it's going to turn uh, let's welcome someone out amen this morning service. Amen. I don't know how true it is, but Pastor Victor Lopez says that his wife sings that song at home. Amen. I got the Victor living in me. Amen. That's what he said. I don't know how true it is. Amen. But <laughs> anyways, amen. Psalms uh, chapter 90 verse 12. One verse of scripture. I had mentioned Sunday that I was going to be ministering on uh, time, amen, the subject of time. I was uh, at Walmart, amen, and they were playing the song from the Rolling Stones, Time is on My Side. And I've heard it, you know, hundreds of times. I never knew what it was about. And uh, I was going to sing it, amen, for you, but I decided to just hold back, amen. I'm going to keep that, that talent hidden, amen, just for tonight. But the song is about a guy telling a girl after she leaves him that time is on his side. He says, you'll be back. In other words, he's going to let time work for him. She is going to realize within time that he was the best thing that she ever had. And so he says, time is on my side. And I want to preach a sermon, amen, that I've entitled Time is on my side. And this sermon is specifically designed for people that are busy. I'm going to preach on procrastination, amen, tonight. And I don't want you to immediately assume that I'm preaching on lazy or slothful people. This message is actually for busy people and how they procrastinate. And so Psalms 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Help us 
to spend them as we should. Let's look at, first of all, borrowed time. God gives us all the time that we need. It doesn't feel that way sometimes, but he does. Did you know that God made every single individual different? That there are no two people the same. Every single person was created differently. Everyone has their own DNA. Everyone has their own set of fingerprints. Um, no two people are the same. That's pretty amazing if you think about the billions and billions of people, amen, that have been born. Psalms 139 verse 14 says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. There is one thing though that God has given us all the same and that is time. Every person in this place has the same amount of time. We all have 24 hours a day. Now, my question to you tonight is, why then does it feel like some people have been given more time than we have? Why does it feel like others have more time than you? One of the main reasons is because of all the time that is wasted uh, throughout the day. Do you ever feel or look at other people and feel like they have more time than you do? The truth is, that they don't. But more than likely, what you are looking at is you are looking at someone who is probably more wiser with the time that they have been given. And they spend it, as the psalmist said in our text, the way that they should. Consider with me any given day. We get up, we get ready, we run errands, we pay bills. We do housework, we cook, we eat, we clean up, and then we get ready for bed. These tasks alone can total as much as five hours a day. It was reported in, New in a Newsweek that the average person spends one hour every day looking for lost stuff. Can you say your keys and your phone? An hour every day looking for lost stuff. Not to mention the time that is being spent looking through emails, text, social media, online shopping. It's no wonder then that we are neglecting the most important things in our lives, our relationships. What is suffering and the area that we begin to procrastinate with is our marriages, our children, our relationship with God, and even our ministries. See, when it comes to relationships, we are becoming procrastinators. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I am not a lazy person. Again, I'm not talking to lazy people this evening. I'm talking to people who are busy or too busy for what really matters in their life. Now, unlike traditional procrastination, this has nothing to do with being lazy or apathetic or disengaged. The truth is that we are working harder today and we are busier today than any other generation before us. But because of it, many times we delay the day's most important things like God, family, friends. Sometimes we do this consciously, sometimes we do it unconsciously. We allow our attention to shift to less important things in our life. Ironically, even the top performers and chronic overachievers battle with this exact same thing. It affects them the same way it affects many of us. Now, I'm talking about people who are well-intended, amen, or well-intentioned, I should say, and trying to do their best job that they can. They get affected by the procrastination that I'm about to minister on tonight. Now, you would think that because we are working harder and faster than ever before, most of us carry a computer in our pocket, the telephone. 
you would think that we would accomplish more. We would get more things done. But the truth is that it can sometimes feel like the harder we work, the more we fall behind. Am I the only one that feels like that? Let's look at a few things that maybe were relevant back in the 70s and 80s when time management was coined or introduced. Now, time management was introduced because uh, the factories started to open up, warehouse work started to open up. People were no longer just working in farms, but they were now working, amen, in factories. Uh, and uh, people began to realize that they were running, running out of time very quickly throughout the day. And what happens many times is that we hold on to these old things that we were taught back in the day. If we're not careful, these things can hinder us today because we don't live in the same time anymore. How many remember being taught that all you had to learn to do was balance? Anybody here, you, you were ever told, if you just learn to balance your marriage, your family, and your job, then you'll have more time for yourself. Time management experts taught this for years. Here's the problem. By definition, balance means equal force in opposite directions, which implies that to be balanced. Our time and energy should be spread in a perfect distribution across various tasks we have in our life. But if we sleep eight hours a day, we work eight hours a day, then to truly be balanced, we could only do one other activity and it would have to be eight hours every day. That concept today is absurd. See, success in business and at home and in life doesn't come from applying our resources proportionately throughout different areas. In fact, it's just the opposite. Success usually is the result of focusing our talents, our money, and our energy in one priority direction for a shorter period of time to create a desired result. Pastor Wayman Mitchell always taught us, you can only do one thing well in life. Let me give you an example here. If you were thousands of dollars in debt, you wouldn't get out very fast if you were only paying off an extra $10 per month or more than your minimum balance. You'd have to find a way to make sacrifices in other areas so that you can focus on that debt, on that card, and get that debt down to nothing. You wouldn't be able to balance your finances, or spread it evenly in order to get out of debt. How many know if you're overweight? Let's say you are 100 pounds overweight. You likely wouldn't get the transformation that you wanted to by working out 10 minutes per week. Instead, what you would have to do is arrange your life in such a way that you would be able to give more like 10 hours a week so that you can get to that desired, acceptable level of health that you are looking for. You wouldn't be able to spread that out. You would have to target. In other words, the issue at hand is the weight, uh, and therefore, you have to begin to focus on the weight. Not sure if you've ever taken a vacation, a long one, or if you've ever been bedridden for three weeks or more. I mean, no, there's only so many reruns you can see and only so much rest you can get before something begins to happen. You begin to get bored. See, if you were only focusing on one thing, you would get to the desired 
destination a lot quicker. I mean, no retirement was taught to us. I grew up hearing people say that retirement was the goal in life. My stepfather's goal, you know, he worked for Buttercrust for 30-something years. And all you ever heard him say, man, is I cannot wait to reach my retirement. And this was taught, amen, especially by the, by the baby boomers. They taught that, that if you work hard enough, then one day you get to retire. So for many, this has become the ultimate goal in life is to retire or to not work. Again, anybody who has not worked for any length of time knows, amen, that you get bored really quick. See, the problem with this mindset is work is looked at as an enemy now. In other words, you have to hurry up and get rid of this because work is what's hindering you from really being happy in life. Listen to this. Work isn't something to be endured that we should try to avoid whenever possible. And it isn't something that should have a finish line that you race to so one day you can stop. The reality is that work is a fundamental part of life and a source of deep satisfaction. I love coming to work. I don't ever, amen, want to stop working. But how many know that's not true for everybody? Not everybody loves their job and there's, there's a reason for that. Now, the very first thing, amen, that God had... Adam do was work. He didn't put there, work for so long and then you get to retire. He made it very clear that work was going to be a part of life. Now maybe, just maybe, the reason that we complain about work or not having enough time is not because work is hard or it's bad, but maybe we are procrastinators. Maybe we put off for tomorrow what can be done today. So then what begins to happen is it begins to pile up. What begins to happen after it begins to pile up is that we become miserable. We become complainers. People that are never happy. Always dreaming of an easier way of life or wishing that they could retire. Wishing that they could be on vacation. See, here's the problem. Now, the reality is that there is no such thing as time management. Because time can't be managed or changed. But there is self-management. You can't manage time. You can't control time. You can't start time. You can't stop time. You can work faster or work slower or work more or work less. But time carries at the exact same rate regardless of what you or I want to do. You can, however, manage yourself. You can choose what you do today with the time that you have been given. See, when people aren't happy with school, work, life, marriage, ministry, I have to ask myself this question. Is life or work really that hard? Or are they just being irresponsible with time? Allowing everything to, to pile up, like I said, to accumulate, amen. What you put off, you now have to tackle the next day. And so you are on constant or on this constant exhausting race against time. You feel like you're never going to catch up. You feel like more gets piled up on you. In the book, Take the Stairs, it talks about how procrastination is the killer of success. How people can't succeed in life 
not because they don't have the tools or the time or because someone or something is holding them back, but because they love to procrastinate. They want success. They want peace. They want rest. They want breakthrough. They want money without having to work for it. People in ministry want anointing. They want favor from God, but they don't want to consecrate themselves. They don't want to put the time in, in prayer, in reading the word of God, in studying. Romans 12, 11 says, be not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. In other words, amen, we have the capability, amen, of being slothful in business. And again, the problem with this is then you begin to look at the good things that God has given you in life. Like your family becomes a problem. Now your wife's always nagging you about time. You never have any time for me. And then eventually she begins to shut down. Your kids begin to wander off. They begin to venture into things, amen, that they ought not to. You tell yourself, I need to get to them. I need to get to my spouse. I need to get to my relationship with God. So many times, like I said, amen, we, we procrastinate so much that it just accumulates. It has this compound effect on us. And it begins to feel like it's somehow, amen, it's overwhelming. There's no way, amen. God is not fair because he has not given me the same amount of time as other people. So let's look at wasted time. What happens when we choose to be slothful in business? See, when we put off things that could be done today for another day or we purposely procrastinate, things have a tendency to pile up on us, like I said. This is where much, believe it or not, of anxiety comes from. This is where depression and misery comes from for a lot of people. A lot of people are filled with anxiety because they're not sure how they're going to take care of the things in their life. Many people are, are miserable because they had an opportunity before, amen, to handle things and take care of things. Or you ran into a, a large sum of money and you had an opportunity to save for a rainy day, but you spent it. And now the car broke or something happens and now. What begins to happen is we begin to whine and complain. We develop this poor me attitude. See, what happens when you procrastinate and things pile up on you is you begin to convince yourself that you are too busy. You begin to tell yourself that you are busier than most people around you. And it's not fair. I mean, oh, we love to give melodramatic sighs when people ask us how we're doing. How you doing, bro? <sighs> Man, I'm so busy. Like, man, I don't have any time for myself. I don't have any time. I, I want to, but, but I don't have any time. Yeah, oh, man, I'm just busy. I'm, I'm so busy. See, we love to do that because it makes us feel a sense of importance about ourselves. It, in reality, when, when people complain about how busy they are every day, what they're doing is they're letting themselves off the hook. See, I can't get to you because I'm too busy making money to support you. You like those tennis you wear, right, Miha? You like your nice clothes? Mommy has to work. Daddy has to work. We have to put overtime. And... It lets us off the hook in our minds. We want people to feel sad for us because of how busy we are. 
in the book Procrastinate on Purpose. He says this, bear with me, I'm going to read quite a bit. See if you find yourself in here. It was almost as if I was allowing myself to perpetuate this story that I was so busy because it gave me some false sense of importance about myself. Then suddenly, out of the blue, one day it occurred to me that the most successful people I knew never complained or even spoke about how busy they were. More than that, they never even seemed to let on to anyone about everything they had going on in their lives. These were people who were at least as busy as me and who had more responsibilities than I did. So I asked one of them about it once, and she said, you reach a point where you realize how uh, futile it is to expand or to expend energy sharing or even thinking about how busy you are and complaining about it. Once you get to that place, you shift to focusing that energy productively, pr productively, sorry, into getting the things done rather than worrying about the fact that you have to do them. I noticed that they weren't necessarily working less than me, but they had a peace about them that I didn't. It was a sense of peace that resulted from their acceptance of their own situation. He says, quit telling everyone how busy you are. Resist the indulgence of saying, I am too busy. Your problem is not that you are too busy. Your problem is that you don't own your situation. You get stressed and frustrated with distractions. Fine, we all do, but your life is your responsibility. Any commitments you have were either made or allowed by you. It's not even right to complain or whine to others about how busy you are. You and I have the same amount of time uh, in a day as Gandhi, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Michael Jordan, uh, or anyone else who has achieved greatness. Once you own your problem, you empower yourself to create your own solution. So the first step is to get over our self-indulgent complaining about how we're so busy or there just isn't enough time in a day. If you are saying those things to yourself, then you are allowing yourself to be a victim like I was. You are not a victim. You are in charge. You are capable. You are powerful enough to decide what you will and won't do with your time. Second is you begin to prioritize. In other words, when you procrastinate, you only have time for what you think is important in your life or really important. How I many know when you're overwhelmed, the only thing you want to do is sleep? You know, there's going to be, I'm not sure if you're the kind of person that has to get eight hours or be in bed at a certain time. If you are, amen, that's perfectly fine. Some people get up earlier than others. But you know, there are people, amen, that if they don't get that amount of sleep that they're used to getting, they're not the same person. It's like they spend all day and all week trying to catch up with that one hour that they did. They didn't get eight hours, they got seven. But they tell themselves that because I didn't. And so now, you see, now your home, your family, your, your work, they, they owe you time. You feel the right to complain, making money. You begin to tell yourself, listen, I have to take care of my family. I have to get ahead. I have to pay for these things. And so what happens is family, ministry, prayer, studying takes the back seat. I have friends like this, even some in the ministry. They're constantly trying to catch up, and so they don't read or study. The last minute, they're, they're Googling for illustrations and, and writing messages, or they call me, hey, bro, man, I'm in a bind. Can you, bro, you're in a bind every week. It's 
It's because, man, I'm having to work more. I'm having to. I wish I had the time you had. I had a guy tell me last week, amen. Man, I could write sermons, man, like you, man. If, you know, I would have all those illustrations and read books like you if I had your time. Proverbs 26, 13 says, the lazy one says, there's a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. In other words, I would do what I need to do, but something is keeping me back from doing it. And so therefore, you begin to prioritize. People like this will hustle on the side to make money, to get ahead, to have nice things. But they forfeit something to do it. Like I said, they, they stop focusing on relationships. They give ministry or their family half efforts. See, some of your biggest hindrances in, in life is people that pick up your slack. People that, that feel sorry for you. Your spouse or your parents or even worse, both do everything for you. And the problem, the reason I say that that's a problem is that when things get hard or they aren't around, things fall apart in your life. Why? Because you're used to everybody else doing everything for you. Sometimes I'll have disciples, amen, throughout the years, you know, go and do stuff. And then I, I run into their wives at Sam's. I'm like, oh, wow, what are you doing at Sam's? Oh, my husband sent me to go get something that you send them to do. Or they're, they're out making flyers or doing stuff, and, and so what they do is they just kind of shift their responsibilities to people that they know will pick up their slack. See, procrastinators always say things like, my boss is too hard. Or my boss is never happy. Or pastor is impossible to please. They never say, you know what? I've been slacking. My boss is upset because I haven't been responsible the way that I, that I should. Remember, it lets you off the hook. To get your family, your home... Or others to believe that somehow life or work is hard. We then begin to do things prematurely. We rush into things that we aren't ready for. Instead of putting in the hard work today, tightening our belts so that you can be blessed later, you get things on credit. People max their finances to the last penny. And they leave no room for life. And then life happens. They didn't calculate life. Payment, uh, car payment is this, house payment is this, uh, toiletries, yeah, 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 yeah. We can cover it, man. We're going to have 10 cents left over, babe, so don't spend it. And then the car breaks. You find yourself working or hustling. Neglecting in order to try to catch up. People will max their finances to the last penny just to wear nice clothes and drive nice cars. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, right? If you are already living in such a way where you don't have to forfeit your family or your ministry or your relationship with God. It took me and Nora years to get what we have today. Decades. People today are crazy. They, they don't want to wait. They want everything today. Pastor, I need, a, I need to wear nice clothes. I need to drive a nice vehicle. I need to live in a nice house. Well, those things take time.
I'm so proud of, uh, proud of Arthur, amen. He uh, bought a car cash. He's 20 years old. He saved up enough money to buy a car cash. It's a beautiful car. Nice Mazda. I was blown away. My wife was telling me that he was thinking about maybe having payments. And, and you know, she had a, a, a talk with them and said, man, you can, you can save up. You, I mean, you can save up enough to buy a car cash so you don't have to be in debt. So you don't have to work more so that you can stay engaged. And he did that. But how many people don't do that? How many people are trying to keep up with everybody else and what pays the price is your family? I've shared this before. You know, the first eight years of my ministry, I bought my suits at Goodwill. We bought all our cars cash. We lived in houses, amen, that most people probably wouldn't want to live in. But we did that knowing that as we got older and later in life, we weren't going to be in debt. We were going to be more free to do what we wanted to without our family paying the price. See, selfishness is the motivation behind procrastinators. They could be better, they could be more responsible, but they are too selfish sometimes. They have time for what only they want to do. This is why we have people that don't come to prayer, because you want to sleep. You don't study or read your Bible because you're too busy working overtime or hustling, making money on the side. You don't invest in your marriage because you're too busy being on the phone, uh, texting or, or, or social media, playing video games. You want me to shock you tonight? There's nothing wrong with playing video games. I'll shock you even more. I play video games. I'm the Dallas Cowboys on Madden. Hey. In my iPad, they win every year. <laughs> but you know when I do it? When all my responsibilities are finished. That's when I do it. If I have time for it. I don't allow it to consume my time or to take away from my children or my wife or my ministries, or my responsibilities. I find it funny when I have a 35-year-old wife complaining about her husband always playing video games. This is why a lot of ladies, amen, they... They don't want to do nursery because they want to be in here hearing every, me every message and being ministered to. They're not willing to sacrifice a service or allow a visitor to get ministered to. Well, I don't like doing nursery. I don't think there's a single woman in this church that likes doing nursery. I really don't. I don't, I don't think there's one. I mean, if you like doing nursery... Unless, like tonight, my grandson, uh, baby Roman's there, then I could see how you would like it, you know, because he's awesome. But what, it doesn't have anything to do with like. It has to do with sacrificing. Self is what got you in debt. Self is many times, amen, what causes homes, amen, to begin to fall apart. Many times, amen, we start off with the right intentions. But if you're not careful, you begin to have to work more and harder in order to have to pay for everything that you felt you had to have back then. Then when the things that you had to have, amen, begin to overwhelm you, you then turn to self again. 
you begin to tell yourself that nobody appreciates you. You're the only one that really cares. You're the only one that really sacrifices in your home. Listen to this. The great 19th century uh, naturalist and Harvard professor, uh, uh, Louis Agassiz, was once approached by the emissary of a learned society and invited to address its members. Agassiz declined the invitation saying that lectures of this kind took up too much time that should be devoted uh, to research and writing. The man persisted, saying that the society was prepared to pay handsomely for the lecture. That's no inducement to me, Agassiz replied. I can't afford to waste my time making money. Can you afford wasting your time making money? The way to know is what condition is your marriage in? What condition are your children in? What condition is your walk with God in? What condition is your ministry in? Can you afford to procrastinate and allow things to keep piling up? So let's close. Let's close, amen, with time is on your side. Getting more time out of your days, amen, is what I want to teach you last. Again, in our text, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. This is the key, is spending our days the way that we should. Let's close with a few things that we must learn if we are going to start to spend our days as we should. And quit being procrastinators. Amen. First is you must learn to multiply time. You say, wait a minute. What do you mean multiply time? You just told us that we only have 24 hours. See, the way that you multiply time is by giving yourself permission to work on things today that will give you more time tomorrow. Another way of putting it is you give attention to the squeaky wheel. You ever heard that, that term, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the attention. The way that you multiply time is you begin to focus on the things that need attention today. So that you can have more time to do all the other things tomorrow. In other words, you procrastinate on purpose. Wait a minute. Now you're really confusing me. You said, you know, you say the entire uh, sermon, you're telling us that procrastination is wrong. Yes. But there is a difference in procrastinating for self-indulgence. So, in other words, not doing what you know should get done today because you're being lazy versus procrastinating on purpose so that you can buy yourself more time tomorrow by taking care of the things that need attention today. You're going to procrastinate on other areas so that you can focus on the main area. You're still going to get to those things, just not today. You're going to give yourself more time today by eliminating some things. See, many of us have daily to-do lists. I don't know if you speak your reminders, amen, into your phone lately. Amen, I've been having to do that a lot more. I also have a list of where uh, I wake up every morning and the night before I made a list of everything that I need to take care of the next day. Anybody do that? Amen? Two of us. Here's the problem with that. It's not bad or good. But sometimes your day doesn't allow you to take care of everything on the list. And I don't know if you're anything like me. I feel bad. I feel like I, like I procrastinated, like I could have done more. Because I didn't take care of everything on the list. You have to be able to give yourself permission to not do everything on the list and sometimes focus on the most important things on the list. 
Not always, but sometimes. There's some days, man, at the end of the day, I mean, I've already checked everything off, man. I had an awesome day. There's some days where things happen, emergencies happen, things break. It doesn't allow me or give me the luxury, amen, to take care of everything on the list. And I have to allow myself or give myself permission to say it's okay. You took care of the things that were most important today. See, there are those that look at their list and feel overwhelmed because they don't feel that they had enough time to knock everything out. So they give up. What time multipliers uh, do is they look at the exact same list and what they care about more is that they were able to take care of the important things of the day. Which allowed them more time on the next day. Number two is you have to learn to focus. That means you have to first eliminate everything that is counterproductive. Then you might also have to start learning. Here, here it goes. This is one of the things people have a lot of trouble, amen, saying is no. I can't help you. Sorry, not today. In order to multiply time, you have to eliminate some things. Eliminate, you know, look at your, your day, your week, your month. We're habit-forming creatures. Look at it and say, what can I eliminate so that I can have more time? What can I say no to so that I can have more time? You have to learn to say no to some things so that you can have more time tomorrow. That means sometimes, you, you, know, you know why we like to say yes to everything? Because we, we love to make it look like we're superheroes. We can handle anything. We can handle our problems and your problems. What you got, man? It's nothing for me. Until you get home and your, your spouse is holding a suitcase. And then those famous words come out. You have time for everybody. You have time for everything but me. We end up saying yes to things that in reality we could say no to. You have to learn to eliminate things that are consuming your time or can wait maybe in order to focus on what's important. Let me ask you a question, guys. Your mom has a flat tire and your wife has a flat tire at the same time. Who do you go help? I hope you immediately said your wife. But I live in the valley. And you have a mom that picks up all your slack. So in your mind, I have to help her because if not, she's not going to help me the way she always helps me. Might have to say no. You're not careful, your spouse is one day going to stop understanding. You might have to say no to your boss in order to tend to your kids. Because one day your kids might stop understanding. Number three is you have to learn to be responsible. Now, what I mean by that is just because you are saying no to some things doesn't mean you're supposed to neglect what you are putting off. Doesn't let, doesn't let you off the hook. You might have to delegate. 
You might have to uh, get back to it. Listen to this. If you are one of those people who live by the creed, never do today what you can put off till tomorrow, you might have to grapple with the following words of wisdom. The next time you find yourself tempted to procrastinate, here's what you do. Just put it off. That's right. Just say to yourself, I'll procrastinate later. Right now, I'll get it done. At some point, I mean, we, we have to be responsible. And what I mean by being responsible is, again, because so many times, I mean, we procrastinate, we end up having to try to catch up, that we end up neglecting the most important things in our lives. So then what happens is that what you have to learn to do is when those things are falling apart, you have to learn to protect. Or you drop everything in order to give attention to what's most important to you. There are things in your life that only you can tend to. No one else can do it better than you. You're going to have to uh, have the greatest impact and results by you doing it and you taking care of the situation. Some situations only you can handle. That's why you can't ever allow guilt to stop you from being responsible. I'm sorry, I have to say no. I'm sorry, I can't go in today. I'm sorry. If you get to that point where things are falling apart, then you have to protect. You have to ask yourself, can this wait? Or do I have to protect it right now? If it can wait, then I encourage you to procrastinate on purpose. Focus on the things that do need your time today so that you can have more time tomorrow. Isn't it amazing when spouses, amen, are uh, concerned with the lack of time that is being spent in the home? I don't know about you, but in the past, amen, when I start spending a lot of time at home, I find out that they really don't want me at home. <laughs> hey, they just, you know what they wanted? They wanted to know that they were number one. They wanted to know that I was willing to drop everything and everyone for them. Once they know that, it's like, you know what? I never realized how much you annoy me because you're never here. Can you go ahead and just go be busy again? What happened? <laughs> you protected. You showed your family that they are the most important thing in your life. See, if you learn some of these things, time will become like compound interest to your finances. And that's how you get time on your side. Amen. Let's bow our heads tonight. Appreciate you. I know this sermon is hard to swallow. Amen. All of us are guilty of procrastinating. Again, I was ministering to people that are busy, that mean well, that have good intentions. I'm not talking about lazy people, people that don't work, people that... You have to ask yourself, why, you're, why are you so busy? You have to quit telling yourself that you're the only one that's busy. You have to quit allowing people to pick up your slack all the time. You know, that gets addictive. It becomes too easy to just call people to take care of things for you. I believe, amen, tonight that if there is an area of your life that is struggling, it more than likely has to do with something that I mentioned tonight. You see, it's rare to get people to admit this, though. 
It's always, I, I do my best. I try everything. I work so hard. I'm always the one that does everything right. And, and they are the ones that. Maybe the Holy Spirit even spoke to you and showed you some things that maybe you've neglected. I believe God wants to help you. You're going to have to learn to multiply your time, though. You're going to have to learn to, to focus on what really needs. See, you know, you know what we like to do is when things are falling apart, instead of us focusing, is we want someone else to fix it for us. We want to keep doing everything that we're doing without having to stop. And focus. That's our responsibility. Amen. I'm all for people helping. I'm all for. But the reality is that if, if we were to just stop. Say, you know what? Some of this is my fault. I've allowed things to accumulate. I feel like I'm at war with time. It's working against me. See, if you were to admit that tonight, I believe God will help you. Before we go any further, you're here tonight, you'd say, Pastor, I am not saved. My heart is not right with God. I know that my heart is not right with God. But I'm ready to repent of my sins. I'm ready to receive Jesus Christ in my heart as my Lord and Savior. If that's you and you want me to pray for you tonight, you want to receive Jesus in your heart, I want you to do one thing for me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Uh, if you want my prayer to receive Jesus in your heart, I want you to lift your hand high enough where I can see it. Amen. God bless you, ma'am. God sees that hand. God bless you, sir. God sees that hand. You can put those down. How many others tonight you want to pray? You want to get right. Amen. Uh, you want to make heaven your home. You want to invite Jesus to live in your heart. If that's you, you have not lifted your hand. I want you to lift it right now and say, that's me. Hallelujah. God bless you, ma'am. God sees that hand. You can put that down. How many others? How many others? Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Backslider, I want you to lift your hand. If you haven't yet, and say, that's me, Pastor. Here's my hand. I'm no longer going to put this off. I'm, I'm getting, I'm doing this tonight. I'm getting it done tonight. Anyone at all? God bless you, sir. God sees this hand. How many others? God bless you, sir. God sees that hand. Anyone else? Before I move on to other things. Every single one of you that lifted your hands, there's many of you. I want you to do one thing. I want you to step out of your seat and I want you to join me and walk to this altar. Amen. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of salvation. I want you to come. Don't be embarrassed. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to come. We're going to pray tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. These are making their way. Glory. You know, if you're not careful, you begin to complain about the people that God gave you to bless you. Amen. You begin to feel like people don't appreciate you. People are never happy or never satisfied. We tend to forget all the areas that we let people down ourselves sometimes. I want to challenge you. Amen. If you were to just be honest tonight, God would help you. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. These altars are open. I feel special grace here and I feel God's going to help. He's going to help us tonight. Amen. His grace is available. Amen. It's available. The Bible says that we are strongest when we are the weakest. Amen. We need to come and humble ourselves before God and say, God, I need help. My life, my world, everything is, is falling apart. Amen. Maybe tonight, amen, that you have allowed yourself to get in debt or to convince yourself, amen, that you deserve to focus on yourself, amen. And tonight, God's going to help us, amen. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, I love you. This is my desire. Oh, yes, it is. To honor you. 
Father, help us tonight, I pray. Deliver us from a spirit, God, of procrastination, God. Help us to repent and begin to focus on the things that are most important, Lord. Our family, our friends, our relationship with you, my God. Oh, yes, amen, hallelujah. Father, I'm asking you to heal families tonight, God. Heal marriages. Lord, I give you my heart. I give Father, heal the brokenhearted. I live for you, well, oh. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. And God's here, amen, tonight. You take your time, you Lord, pray. Have your Believe God for each other. Believe God for yourself. This is my desire to honor Oh, God, help you. us, God, to invest. Lord, Father, the important things in life, God. My heart, our relationship with you. I worship you forgive us if we have neglected you father and all that is within me oh lord we love you i give you oh lift your hands and all out loud, amen. Lord, I give you my heart, amen. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your oh, way. Hallelujah. Let's worship Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight, Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for your word, my God, tonight. Lord, we love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We worship you, my God. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you tonight. If you are used to people always uh, picking up your slack, amen, feeling sorry for you and doing what you can't, and I'll do this, I'll do that so that you can have more time, amen. I want to encourage you tonight, amen, to, uh, sever that. It's, it's costing you. You think it's buying you time, but it's really costing you in the long run. Amen. And uh, amen. Uh, others here, amen, that, like I said, uh, drop everything. Your family, your, your spouse, your, your children, they are the most important thing. And like sometimes you just got to stop and just let them know that, 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 that they are more important than anything. And you, you're willing, amen, to work, invest on them. Amen. And I believe, amen, if you do that, God's going to get behind you. Amen. Father, thank you for all that you've done tonight. We, we feel your presence here, Lord. We feel your Holy Spirit. And I know, Lord, that there are those that are going to even go home and even, my God, the Lord, begin to meditate on what they heard tonight. Father, touch them, God, I pray. God, uh, Lord, I'm believing you, Lord. Uh, Father God, the Lord, for our families, our homes, Lord, um, and our church, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are dismissed, church. God bless you.